From here, we're going to invite Christy Necklison from Youth Eastside Services to come up for the panel. She's the clinical supervisor and co-occurring therapist in YES's Substance Abuse Services Department, and she's worked at YES for 20 plus years. And then we also have Bellevue High School counselor Maureen Trevier for students S through Z. Our own Bellevue High School counselor is here. Okay, here's our first question. Who should be your first call when, you when you're really struggling for help? And where do you go for help when your child, for your child when you know you're dealing with a very serious situation? I think that would be Christy. Okay, is this on? Yes, it is. Um, you know, having that conversation, being aware, being willing to learn, not, you don't have to know everything first. So we would be one of those places where you would go when you have all those questions and when you're wondering, what do I do next? Um, Youth Eastside Services has a substance abuse department, but we also work with co-occurring disorders. So not necessarily does everybody who comes to us, though, end up in that treatment phase. The first step is often a phone call with some questions. Um, a second step might be to the alcohol drug education class that I think Kim mentioned, um, which is offered one Saturday a month for both youth and parents. Um, we don't believe in... Um, separating the youth and parents um, when we're talking about the education and trying to start the conversation. Um, and that is open to anyone. The next step is doing an assessment. And I think sometimes that sounds really scary. And sometimes parents feel like, oh, we're already you know, off the deep end with that. But I like to say an assessment is merely gathering information and running it by someone else um, and putting that together and saying, is there a problem here? And if there is a problem, how big of a problem? And what might we do about it? And the answer to that can vary. And I think if you can share with your youth that same attitude of, let's get rid of the stigmas around people having a problem with substances. As you heard from Dr. Walker, people are gonna end up with problems with substances that basically hijack the chemicals in your brain. It isn't a thing about being good or bad. Um, it's simply what happens when you reach a certain level of use with certain substances, and youth are much more vulnerable to that. Um, and if we look at it that way, then it's like looking at what's healthy, what isn't healthy, and what are we gonna do about it? I think Maureen, did you wanna say anything on that too? I know sometimes the, the high school counselor might be the very first person that you know you go to for that right and I I do work with parents and families and students and one thing that we um, have at Bellevue High School is a drug intervention program that is uh, put on by graduate students at Seattle Pacific University they work under the direction of Dr. Stewart who is um, has a long-term research study to work on the impact of intervention on minimizing drug and alcohol use so we've had a number of students and work, go through that program, and in fact, the interventionists at SPU are in all of our high schools, as well as high schools in the Highline District. And we've had the program for about five or six years. Bellevue High School was the first school in the district that hosted the interventionists. And I've had some students that go through there, and they, and they love working with these um, grad students because they're young, and. And you know they're they're very close to their age, and they they look just like them. They're not old, and so they um, work with them. And even the students who don't want to work with them, we say just just meet them. And what the program is, it's an eight-week program. They um, do an individualized assessment with the students, and then they custom design an eight-week plan to help the students either reduce or abstain from drugs and alcohol. And they've had a very high success rate. Um, they work with them on skill building as well as problem solving and you know role playing and that kind of thing. So that's a program that we have at Bellevue High School. Thank you, mm -hmm. thank you. This is an interesting question. They all are pretty much, I'm kind of reading through them. Hookah smoking, smoking is often portrayed as being healthier than smoking traditional cigarettes. Is this true? Does the water really filter the tobacco such that it is less carcinogenic? What are the potential risks and side effects of hookah smoking? Can you smoke more than just nicotine in those hookahs? 
I think again, <laughs> Dr. Walker. Yeah, that's that little game. I would take it, but I'm going to let <laughs> <laughs> I think that's that little game again about what's worse and what's safer and what's not. I, you know, there's no research. I mean, I've seen some research on hookah just watching how many people are beginning to use it and how many kids are using it, but uh, we have no evidence that vaporizers are even safer, for sure. You know, we don't know. Of course, it's not smoke, but then there's something else that comes out. Um, you know, we don't know all of those questions. I would say it's safe that if you're inhaling things, um, whether it's with hookah, with, you know, the vaporizers, it's usually not natural stuff that you're putting in your body. It's probably not going to be that great, but we don't have a lot of research to say it's, you know, better than this or less than that. I, once you go down that road, kids go down that road, and you know if they're doing hookah, they're going to be smoking, and you know because you can't do hookah all the time. You know it, it becomes a, a, a circular thing. There, a lot of kids like the hookah because they have that flavor. Um, you know you can put flavors in, and they think it's okay. A lot of kids think there's no tobacco or anything bad in there. It's just flavored stuff. You know, so um, I think when you hear about hookah, you want to educate yourself and try to educate them a little bit. Thank you. I add one thing to that, if you don't mind? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, just about smoking marijuana as a whole, just from my previous experience and contacts with people on the street, one of the best arguments I've heard about the marijuana and consuming it about being natural, you really don't know who's growing it and where they're growing it and what they're putting in it. Absolutely. And that's one of the yeah. best arguments I've seen out there is because there's a lot of times we'll combine the drugs together. Um, we had an incident not too long ago where... A male was not acting like he was under the influence of marijuana, and he told us he'd smoked the, and I'm going to quote, sparkly, sparkly weed. And he didn't know what was on it, smoked it anyways, and he had a very bad trip because it was probably LSD or some other hallucinogenic uh, on top of it. So a lot of times they don't know where this marijuana is being grown. They don't know who's doing the growing. They don't know what chemicals they're using, what fertilizers. You know, you're, you're dealing with a product, but unlike marijuana or a drug where it's coming from the FDA with oversight, there is no oversight on marijuana. They're just selling marijuana as marijuana. We don't assume that all marijuana is the same. So when they're saying that it's all natural, you don't really know what the product is that you're sticking inside your pipe before you smoke it. So that's something to think about as well, that you're seeing abnormal behavior in your child. It may not be just marijuana they just smoked. It may be something else where it could be a medical. Yeah, that's a great point. A great point. Um, what does it mean to be perped at Bellevue High School? Anybody know that one? Perped, P-U-R-P-E-D. Does anybody know what that means? <laughs> oh, per purple policy? Okay. Interesting. There it is. <laughs> All right. Where is the closest pot shop going to be to the school? How many will there be and where they'll be? Where will they be and when will we know? What kind of enforcement is there going to be against sales to minors? That's a lot of questions. I can yes, only take is. one, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I can tell you that the zoning restrictions in the city of Bellevue are, are very conservative. And what I mean by that is the last time I heard, there's really only one place in the city where you can grow marijuana and that is in the uh, sort of the Factoria area off of Richards Road and the industrial park back there. Do you kind of know where I'm talking about? That's the one area of the city that has the appropriate distances from educational institutions, daycares, all that. It's zoned in light industrial and I believe there's already at least one permit approved for a manufacturing plant there in Bellevue. Uh, what were the other issues on that question? Um, hmm. Shops, we don't know yet. Yes. We don't how know many, where the How many is. will there be? Where yeah. will they be? When will we know? I don't remember. I and think what kind Bellevue of enforcement is there going to be against sales to minors? Okay. So there's a, there was a lottery system for cities and municipalities in mm -hmm. the state of Washington to um, sell marijuana. And I believe there will be th there, there are three allotted in Bellevue, I think is the right number. Is anybody, can anybody correct me on that if I'm wrong? Mm -mm. It's a low number. We got a very mm -hmm. few of them that are going to be in Bellevue. And we don't know where yet. Uh, okay. And the last part was enforcement, was enforcement of sales to minor. Mm -hmm. the enforcement of liquor and marijuana sales um, stem from the Liquor Control Board, and they're still trying to figure out how they're going to govern all that. We don't even know exactly. yet. Exactly. Okay. Well, thank you. All right, here's a good one, too. How can a parent determine whether a teen is just experimenting or whether they have moved on to abuse? What are the signs that should set off a parent's internal alarm bell? 
I mean, Scott, you want, I know you said yeah. stuff too a little bit, but oh. I know a few of you can, can talk about that one. Um, my, my belief is, is, is whether it's experiment or moving on, you know, something significant has happened to push them in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, I don't, I don't believe that anyone just wakes up one day and says, hey, you know, I'm gonna experiment with heroin today, or, you know. Um, Ryan, uh, Ryan's first exposure was with marijuana in middle school. Not that he wasn't offered, uh, we found in his journal, that he was offered it as a second grader by some high school students. Um, which is another thing you're fighting, is poor decision making by high school students. Um, the, the question as far as, it, it's a problem either way. Whether it's experimentation, it, it's a problem either way and it needs to be addressed. Um, I, I don't think that you should take either lightly. I just want to say, you know, experiment means experiment. That's one or twice. If they go back ex another time, they're going back for a reason. They're going back mm -hmm. for an experience. Um, experiment is a very short, short time mm -hmm. of just once or twice. You know, past that, people are moving on to use it for a reason. And then from there, somewhere along the way, some of those kids will become dependent. And just to add on, you know, as, as probably a, a really good question to, to ask them if they say they're experimenting, what are you hoping the experiment is going to prove? That you're addicted or that you, you're, you're, you're an addict? I mean, it's, it's, a, pretty, it's a pretty big gamble. Mm -hmm. It's putting all your money on red or putting all your money on black. And, and you know, someone could be a very big loser. Mm -hmm. um, so experiments are supposed to have a, a purpose, you know, um, scientific theory. Again, ask them, what are you trying to prove? What are you trying to figure out here? Whether you're going to become a drug addict or not? Because that's, that's what they're doing. And I think, too, if I could s speak to the, the assessment that can be done through a drug and alcohol center or referral through your uh, family physician, what the assessment does is it, it, it's a pretty good uh, yardstick for measure. It's a snapshot of where the user is on the, on the spectrum, and then with that comes recommendations for the appropriate treatment for where they are on that spectrum. And then and the other thing is it's objective facts. I mean, the disadvantage we have as parents is that they don't believe us. So, you know, it's, it's another piece of information that's got some credibility, um, and, and it's a fairly accurate tool for where they are at that moment in time. And Crystal. most professionals would approach it just as Dr. Walker said, one to three times max experimentation. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, you're looking at use. And in our minds, I mean, that is abuse for an adolescent because of the dangers to the developing brain and developing personality and the learning. Um, and I think one thing just to add to that about the importance of getting the assessment and looking into it, not being afraid of doing that, um, is if you can find a provider who is used to working with adolescents. I think that that's preferable just because, um, as Maureen was saying, different people work differently with young people and they are rather averse to that sort of, I will tell you what the facts are. And um, you're looking for someone who is going to work with them to say, let's look at the facts. How do you know that this is a good fact, as Paul was pointing to? Um, let's look at kind of decisions. How do you make a good decision? How is this impacting you? Um, and looking for that kind of motivation for them, as well as then knowing when to step in when there's addiction and dependency, where there's a lot less choice and decision making to be involved and more um, input and strength on the part of the parents. So we, you've heard a lot about assessments. What I'd like to say is that assessments are only as good as the quality of the information you get from the person you assess. I found that um, in working with young people, they traditionally lie for two reasons. One, because they don't want to get in trouble. And two, because they have something to protect. I found that kids who are experimenting and misusing alcohol and drugs tend to lie because they believe they're going to get in trouble if they're found out. People that are abusing or becoming dependent are actually protecting a relationship that they've now began to develop with their drug and the paraphernalia they, they use, their, <clears throat> that they use to use that drug. 
Um, one of my favorite questions to ask kids is, what is the name of your bomb? You would be amazed at some of the creative names kids have shared with me about the paraphernalia they use. And then the grieving process they actually experience when that paraphernalia breaks or gets lost. This is a kid who is abusing and or dependent on a drug. Because we as human beings tend not to create uh, personal relationships with inanimate objects unless there's some payoff from them. And that's something that, we, that, that I see a lot of, mostly because I'm kind of working with, around kids who are now uh, deeply in crisis and in residential treatment or something. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And one thing, one thing I've um, come to understand by talking with our interventionists and talking with students is that students um, drink and they use drugs for the same reason that adults drink, and that is to relax. Mm -hmm. And they're very stressed, um, just like adults are stressed, and at the end of the day, adults might have a drink or when they're eating dinner. So kids, you know, they're using the, the drugs and alcohol for the same reason. So what I try to do when I'm working with students and what the interventionists do is we try to help them understand that, yes, you need to take care of yourself and you need to find ways that are healthy choices to help you relax. So substituting some of those healthy things for, you know, the thing that's real easy to get, the drinking or the drugs, and that's kind of a lifelong skill that you can learn is, is something that will help you relax, and it's gonna be different for everybody, but we, we do a lot of kind of skill building that way to help students know that it is okay, and it's, it's something you really should work on to take care of yourself, and, and stress is gonna happen, and, and you can minimize that, but there are other choices you can make. All right, great, thank you guys. Um, if, a teen, if teens sneak pot and alcohol into a home and consume it when an adult is not present, what is the responsibility and potential liability for the parents or owners of the home? And secondly, if adults knowingly look the other way while alcohol or pot is consumed by minors in their home, what are the legal ramifications? Two part. Anybody? You, you can't, I mean, to answer the first part mm -hmm. of the question, there's no liability if there's no bad faith. You know, I mean, if you don't know what's going on, mm -hmm. how can you be held accountable? Now, once you are aware of what's going on, you are accountable. You're, right. you're, you need to, it's you know, that choice of being part of the solution or part of the problem. And um, there's, there's all kinds of rationalizations uh, for why parents choose to turn a blind eye or facilitate the activity because they think they're mitigating the harm or things like that. But um, th they do accept liability and responsibility. And they're also modeling that behavior. Could I just add that we should probably put a little bit of a disclaimer on that and say that there may not be liability and that you can certainly be sued for anything and any reason by anyone. So if somebody were to overdose on a product in your home while you're not there, I guarantee you you're going to be sued and then it'll be up to the lawyers to determine whether or not you're liable. Yeah, I'm talking about criminal liability in that sense. Because oh, it's yeah? different here than uh, like on Mercer Island, for instance. On Mercer Island, there's a fine if, if you're having a party at your home on Mercer Island, but in Bellevue, that's not the case. Say that again? If on Mercer Island, I understand there's a, if, you, if you're a parent and you get caught with kids in your house or you're ha away, you know, and you're fined. But here in Bellevue, that's not the case. There is no fine instituted if, you're have a, if your kid has a party at, at your house. Okay. No, you the, the secondary yeah, warning, though, was as far as a civil suit, uh, to which you would right. be very liable. Right. Yeah. There, there are criminal laws against providing the location to consume mm -hmm. illegal drugs or alcohol, or the transportation, or you know, right. basically just facilitating the activity. Exactly. There are criminal penalties for okay. that. All right. I know it's eight. I have eight thirty-five. Is everybody okay? Going maybe another couple questions. I know we didn't have anybody step up, so I'm just reading from the basket. So these are all questions that were submitted online and out front. Um, how do you get or give advice on the dangers of taking other people's ADHD drugs to focus on tests? In college, it is much more prevalent to use these drugs to help with the pressures of tests. Where is the information to how addictive and bad these drugs can be for people who do not need them for ADHD? 
I would say it's it's not just in college, it's in schools. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of kids use a lot of people's drugs. I've had parents tell me that they've gotten other people's drugs to give their kids because they were certain it would help them. Um, I, I think, you know, there's still a lack of understanding that if you don't have ADHD, it actually does not help you to do better. You think it's helping you because that's what the drug does. It gives you that feeling that you're on top of things, you're smart, you're ready, but there's no evidence when people look at it that people without ADHD who use those drugs actually do better. Um, but a lot of parents and a lot of kids are convinced of that. And there are a number of people who are diagnosed with that. There are a lot of pills around. There's a lot of diversion. So um, it does happen. And um, it, again, I think that's one of those things parents need to be aware of and really understand that it's not OK to take other people's medicine. Um, you know, like I said, when people come to my clinic, sometimes they'll say, well, um, our friend has some ADHD medicine, and you know, we used it on my son, and it seems to work well, so we're here now to get a diagnosis so we can get our own. I've heard that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not okay, you know, and it, it, you know, a lot, most of the time they don't have ADHD as well. Um, so it's around, it's very available. If you have more money, you can pay for it, you can get it as a kid. Um, but you know, it, it wouldn't be recommended, and I think that people need to talk about it more um, than, than we do. Just nothing to add, it's not just ADHD drugs. If you go home and look in your medicine cabinet tonight, and you've got cough syrup, which has an addictive uh, drug in it. You may have leftover drugs from the last time you had painkillers for some sort of surgery or medical. Um, the other part is kids are resourceful. Uh, you know, maybe grandma and grandpa have it in their medicine cabinet. They, they are in their bathrooms as well. So a lot of times, kids are actually getting the drugs from their own residences, from grandma's house, from grandpa's, from sick parent. How often does somebody look inside the medicine bo tablet bottle and say, I've got four left and you'll miss one or two? So look in your house. We do, uh, the Belly Police Department accepts the uh, expired drugs. I know the local hospitals, you can drop them off as well. If you don't need them, don't keep them in your house because you're just giving an avenue to your kids or someone else's kids to come inside your house and take those drugs out because we, we rarely notice them because we're not using them anymore. And again, a warning for like cough syrups and other medications. If you look out there, those are being abused by kids as well. There's a term you'll hear young people using today uh, called uh, trail mix. It's not the stuff you buy at the hiking store. It's uh, the different drugs that they've stolen from different uh, medicine cabinets, and they're thrown into a bowl, and you grab a handful. And sometimes they get really creative because they mix it with pretzels and peanuts and, you know, check mint checks, you know, rice checks, corn checks, and that kind of stuff. It, and they just call it trail mix, and they eat it by the handful. It's it's uh, um, frighteningly common, uh, as a, as a uh, where you see um, large groups of kids congregating together to have parties. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Scott and I were on a panel last week, as a matter of fact, with Microsoft and uh, DrugFree.org. Uh, which has an excellent video on their website um, called Out of Reach, which is about prescription drug abuse. So we're looking at all of these, the pain meds, um, as well as everything from ADHD. And a couple of things that came out of that is one, you know, here, awareness. You have awareness. Go home and check your medicine cabinet. And then the other thing is, you know, maybe you want to make some judicious decisions about how much of the medication, even if it's prescribed to your child, like an ADHD med, they have in their possession at any given time. Um, and maybe you want to set up boundaries about that. But for sure, talking about um, why they're taking the medication, how it's effective, and how it isn't effective. Yeah. One thing, too, um, I've seen kids snort their antidepressant, take their grandfather's hypertensive medicine. I mean, if you're a kid, you don't know. I mean, that you know, I'll see kids will come with a Ziploc and say, these are my pills, and when I feel bad, I just take some. Um, you know, it, it, all the medicines, even if they're not Tylenol, you know, all of those really should be carefully cared for at home because many of those that you don't think of are actually lethal, like Tylenol. Mm -hmm. It's the same with uh, mixing cough syrup and Sprite for setup. Oh, yeah. It's called drank or purple drink. Purple drink. Couple, so. couple things. If, um, you know, if you have a safe at home, locking up your opiates, your, your mood, and, um, altering drugs. Um, but the one thing we haven't talked about is um, should they be in a position 
where someone has overdosed. Um, there is a law in the state of Washington that they can call 911. The, the person who has overdosed will get help and no one will be arrested. And I think that it's very important for the kids to know about that, you know, because, you know, the law is there for a reason. Um, we had a gal that uh, did a lot of work for us, um, uh, Mallory uh, Smith, who found some ecstasy in her house, um, invited some friends over, had some wine. Um, uh, the one friend had been taking some dietary supplements. She asked for more ecstasy. She passed out. They laid her down. The next morning, the two of them woke up and she was dead. Um, that is a part of the way that we got to the point where, you know, you've got to do something. You, you know, you've got to call 911. And they've made it so that um, if you call 911, you're not going to get arrested if it's, it's to get someone some help. So that, again, it's about conversations with your kids, like informing them that that's out there. Okay, I think we have... Using drugs to study. Um, this is a, you know, a lot of people don't understand. They, they may have, you know, like used lots of caffeine and that type of stuff during their own college years and that. But there, when you use drugs to study, it's called, uh, it's called, uh, the term is state dependent learning. And it has a diminishing return. So the more that somebody relies on that process in order to prepare themselves, to do better on exams over time, they consistently start doing worse on the exams because they find that they need to be in the in the same state of under the influence to take the exam as they were when they studied for the exam. And I see this uh, with kids at Bellevue College, uh, you know, who will you know ask me questions about, hey, you know, I've been doing this to, you know since I was a sophomore in high school, and now I can't seem to pass the test. And we talk about just how you change the way in which the, the brain processes information and how it retains information. So to keep in mind, you know, that if you think, you know, maybe that 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 box of vitamin or that, uh, you know, that uh, no dose or something like that's going to help over time, it's a diminishing return. So it doesn't make them stronger. I have a question. Sure. Um, I, there were a couple of points that were made that were um, very, um, King Scott, your point that watch your kids, look for signs, pay attention, very, very important. Um, but what if you're aware of other people's children drinking? That's the situation I'm in. I don't think my daughter's drinking. I watch her like a hawk, but I know her peers are and she's feeling a lot of pressure. Do I go to their parents and say, hey, I think your kids are drinking. I think they're smoking pie. Mm -hmm. What do you do? That's a tough situation. It is. It's a very tough situation. And, you know, a lot of what we're talking about tonight, um, I would tell you, yeah, new, breaking news, you need to be ready before this happens. And I'm sorry it's happening to you right now. Um, uh, Drugfree.org website has classified um, parents in four categories. You're either in prevention, you're in intervention, you're in recover or a treatment, or you're in recovery. You are a parent of one of those kids. Um, be the parent in prevention. Start looking at that website now. Don't wait to go to the website. The, the worst thing you can do, the worst thing that is all of a sudden it's upon you and you're scrambling for resources and you have no idea where to go. You know, when we found out Ryan was using drugs, you know, well, which one's the best place? Where do we go? There's no great place to go for that. To answer your question more to the point, um, again, it's about getting ahead of it. You know, when I'd want to know. Um, bottom line, when Ryan started using, no one knocked on our door. No one called our house. Ryan went to treatment. He relapsed six months later. No one knocked on our door. No one called our house. But there were 650 people as memorial service, and most of them were his high school friends that wished they had said something. Um, say something, yes. Is it going to be 
well received? It may not. But um, Well, I, I I hope that the parents can be a little more adult than that. I hope that the parents can understand that this is you know, this this is not out of malice. I'm not trying to hurt somebody. I'm trying. I see a problem. I'm trying to help. Mm -hmm. um, I would rather have them be mad at me for the rest of my life than be dead at 17. I agree. I have, I've done that as well, and I've had those conversations, and sometimes it's uh, well-received and productive, and you really feel like you're, you've made a difference by having that conversation, and other times you just know that they are checked out, they don't care, they're going to turn their head the other way and ignore it. But I agree with Scott that uh, if you don't try, you know. But you know what you can do, too, is wor work with your daughter on that and, and say, you know, as your mom, I feel like I want to help you. And this is what I'm thinking that I want to do. But I don't want to alienate you from your friends. And w see if you can come up with a plan with her that is acceptable to her. Mm -hmm. I might also recommend partnering with your school, calling the school counselor, having a conversation with them. Sometimes they have noticed similar concerns about the same group of students. And rather than thinking about that as getting them into trouble, but I always look at that as, how can we get the awareness and the information to the people who need it most, which in this case would be the parents? Yeah, one, one thing I would say too, um, that I see that other end, where I'll see parents come in and say, well, you know, we had a couple calls. Now, they might have not been nice to the people who called, but when they got a couple of calls, you know, the school called and the friend called and a mom called, they're in my office because now they're worried, you know, that they're, they can't continue denial, um, and, and that's important. The other thing I would suggest, um, too, is even going to YES. We, we actually recommend a lot of our patients go there now because most kids that are with other kids that are using are going to use. Are they already using or within six months they will be using, or they, they move out of that friendship? Um, because you can't really stay with people who are drinking and getting high and you're sober. That doesn't work. So, you know, when you see that it, it, and, and the friends are changing, they're getting older, they've gone to a place where your child isn't going, it's, it's important to try to help, find, help them find other, you know, groups, other places, other outlets, because um, if they're not going to use it, probably won't keep those same friends. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Any, yeah. Oh, sure. I know it um, is 10 till, one of the, we all uh, okay? One of the things that I really admire, one of the drug and alcohol counselors up in Lake Stevens did was they, um, uh, CPIC and formulated a, a, the ability for there to be anonymous emails sent to drug and alcohol counselor, bypassing the administration for the, the, the purpose of getting help. So the idea here is, is that um, Paul, my teacher, um, Christine, my friend, both sent an email to the drug and alcohol counselor saying, I'm worried about Scott. Um, his grades are dropping, his friends have changed, he's withdrawn from me, we no longer hang out, um, you know, I'm, I'm seeing some, I'm worried. And the great thing about that is, is the drug and alcohol counselor gets that, it's anonymous. And he says, okay, I've got two people worried about the same person saying about the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. That gives me reason to believe this person could be in trouble and they go talk to them. And if they want to know who it is, I'm sorry, I can't tell you. Um, I would advise you to look at um, Lake Stevens High School website um, under parent resources, I believe it is, and you can make an anonymous referral, and it's pretty elaborate. It's, it's very well done. It check boxes, you know, for this behavior, that behavior, specific things, but it's, it's anonymous, and it's, it's a route for students, parents, teachers to um, get somebody some help. In many schools, it may not be as formal as that, but um, I understand from Maureen that the interventionist certainly could handle an anonymous referral, would be willing to talk to a student who is concerned about their friends as well anonymously. Um, and oftentimes there's either interventionists or there's prevention specialists or a substance abuse counselor on the campus. And, and I'll just reiterate that you can always make a, a phone call to the counselor um, or an email and the students are never in trouble. They can remain anonymous. You as parents can remain anonymous and we can 
certainly um, refer them to our interventionists and say, you know, we have people that are concerned about you. Um, so that's something that um, we're happy to, to handle and, and pass on. And what I was mistaken in saying the goal is to get them help, not get them kicked out of school. Right. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, are they're not okay? in trouble. Are we okay going over? I mean, we're really over. Are we okay to keep? Well, can she ask her question, or is that in? Okay, thank you. Are we okay to, to go another round here? Principal? One more, okay. Well, um, I'd just like to say that I am a parent uh, of a child in recovery. Um, my 15-year-old is uh, about 46 days sober. We had to send him away to a 30-day uh, rehab facility. And Youth Eastside Services has been phenomenal. I love it. Um, I came up here. I wasn't going to say anything until um, you talked about talking to other parents. I call everybody and anybody. Anybody who would listen to me, this is, I, I, I have, it's my child's bad choices. I gave him all the tools to make good choices. His answer to me is, it was easy. I could leave campus in the middle of the day, go steal from Safeway, and get drunk. Um, nobody asked him if he was high. Um, he would come home high. Um, and after working with counselors for 30 days, for actually longer than that, since September, we all came to the conclusion that uh, there was no, account of, no accountability. He got caught stealing. The manager said, don't come in here again. He's like, you're the only one that has a problem with it. So, Talk to other parents. Tell your child, it's illegal, I will not tolerate it. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to listen to them. Don't be embarrassed to say anything to your child or to someone else. Everyone's there to support you. I mean, if they're gonna judge you, then you just have to let them go. But yeah, I called everybody. My child's doing this, please help him. Please let me know. Mm -hmm. Because if when I don't know, I can't help him. So. Thank you so much for modeling you. that. And thank you for being proud of your child's recovery, too. That's yeah. a great accomplishment, it's and it means easy. a lot to hear somebody saying that because I feel like I, it's just so important to decrease the stigma. People don't get help when there's such a stigma. Thank well, you. Well, I'll just add quickly that he was supposed to come home two Sundays ago, and he was so stressed out to come home that they had to keep him an extra week. It wasn't like he was over the addiction, but he was so scared to come back to school. And what are people gonna say? And he's the kid that uses, so what is he gonna do now? And it's, it's hard, it's very hard, but it's doable. So I'll, I'll happily answer questions, um, tell my story. Um, if Thank you like for to. that, Anyone that was has awesome. Questions? Thank you. And I know it's like 8.56, 8.55, we'll probably wrap you guys up. Maybe stay around for a couple of minutes if you're able to. And then if... Oh, that's right. Well, I, I just wanted to say, I, I'm from Newport High School, I'm a parent. And um, I don't understand, you had referenced the um, dog search mm -hmm. yesterday. And I don't understand why we aren't getting better communication from the school <coughs> in the sense that that's the first time I ever heard that the drug bus or the suspensions mm -hmm. um, in the last, this last semester equal this, the suspensions for the last two years. Why aren't we getting information like that as parents? I, you know, I, I feel like the school is trying to cover it up and it's really bad for the community. We need to know. Right, and maybe, I don't know if maybe the principal could talk on that one. Can I respond? We're, we're just like you, just like the, the parents have brought it up earlier, right? We're, we're not in the habit of sharing that kind of news. So even for me to share with my parents, our alcohol rate, kids coming to the school, those, those are things we tend not to share publicly. Why? I, I think there's a sense of not wanting to put a bad face on things. I agree. And, I and so it, it, it took me, yes, it's not good press. And, um, you know, I know that the principal from Roosevelt shared stuff about his school today. And it's everywhere. People are talking about it. And it becomes that piece. So you're right. We as, a, as institutions, I don't say just Bellevue High School or just Newport, we tend not to share that information. And it was a lot for me to put that in an email. And some parents going, oh, my God, is Bellevue a bad school? Look at half the kids drank within the last 30 days that are seniors. There's something bad with Bellevue High School. And so we're just as protective of our 
schools as you are of your kids. And so we need to get past that a little bit to have this, this is, this is happening. This is happening here. That's why I, as a principal, said I'm fully in support of this event tonight. I'll be here, and I just that's, that was the reasons behind it for us. So. Yeah, I, I really commend really you for that, and and I want to say that I feel that we are not in partnership at Newport with administration, and I think that is a real disservice to all of our kids. You know, I, I would say one thing about that because um, I, I work with some schools and. And, and sometimes, you know, people, a school will act a certain way because of the response they've gotten. You know, it's a two-way street. And um, even with colleges, you know, they have, a, I mean, that's the time when some kids just really, that we're using in high school, just go really off the deep end. And they don't talk to the family. And the reason why is because they get so much pushback from parents when they start talking about drugs and alcohol that they have learned not to talk about those things. I mean, it's circular. Um, and just recently, I've seen a school that we've been trying to get engaged for years because we've seen, you know, just, I mean, my little program, I see so many kids in this particular school we've been trying for years. It took a parent that got upset about something that he found out with his kid, and now the school is completely on board. So I think it's circular. A parent has, you know, parents have to be willing to hear the information. Um, you know, there isn't one particular school. It's, you know, we know that, but, um, but you know, it's parents have to really have a two-way street with their school and be willing to hear that hard information. And I think sometimes that's not the case. One thing that I think could be super effective is taking that announcement from Newport. When I heard that, I was like, hooray, they're going to step up and they're going to speak about it and they're going to take off kind of the cloak of invisibility. Now there's that opportunity for partnership. And so maybe really emphasizing you know, as a parent, I went to this other event. Um, I love the fact that you are willing to step up and be honest about kind of what's going on here because all schools are struggling with this, all schools. Um, and I want to partner with you in let's deal with this for our kids. And I, I just want to say kind of in defense of the Newport administration, they are, when I was an SRO 12 years ago, drug dogs coming to campuses started to become a routine thing. And when I took over the position of the supervisor years ago, a year ago or so, it had lapsed. And Newport led the charge in getting that going again. This, the dog that was there at the school yesterday was the first time in a year, at least the year that I've been in this position, that that's happened. And it was because of a lot of initiative and hard work and perseverance on the part of the administration and the officer who was there. And you know, when he told me yesterday, he said, we only got marijuana out of one car. And I said, I don't care. You sent the right message. Y you you reinforce the message that it's a matter of concern. The school takes it seriously, and they're going to do. They're going to go to this extent. So, one last thing, er, well, when it comes to to the truth about drugs and alcohol in your school, consistently over the last six to ten years, what is the first thing that gets cut out of a school? drug and alcohol counselor. Six years ago, there would be one for every school. Now you have one for three to five schools. They're so busy running down um, uh, kids that need help right now that there's, there's very little resources to do prevention. It's the first thing to get cut, and it's one of the things that we most need. And um, I find that each school has its own kind of culture. And it, when I and I find that part of that culture is driven by uh, the struggles the members of the administration <coughs> have in trying to find a, a sort of a workable solution to how they're going to address the problem. And so um, I, there's one high school where the principal uh, was contemplating creating a designated medical marijuana smoking section in the parking lot because he didn't know that the medical marijuana card was not a prescription. He thought that he was obligated as the Americans with Disabilities Act to provide that safe place for a student to use their, their medical marijuana. 
marijuana. And so I think a lot of times what happens is that they're struggling to find out um, how to get not only um, ideas about how to resolve and continue to approach uh, their students with this stuff, but also just keeping up with the education and the information about what all these different things are. Um, even the, uh, the e-cigarettes, um, it's, it's not uncommon that in a way you might, you might see a, a young person in the back of a class looks like they're sucking on a straw from something like a bottle of pop they have in their pocket. And what they're doing is they're taking, you know, they're taking a the hit off of their e-cigarette, and more than likely they have some form of cash oil. So, I mean, they're they're just struggling. I think at each school, their culture is driven, it, in some ways, is driven a lot by those struggles. And so, there's a tendency to not want to tell taxpayers, hey, this is what's happening in our school because we're hoping as taxpayers that we can be depending upon them to provide a safe environment for our kids. And, you know, so it, it's a challenge. I mean, it's a huge, huge challenge. Um, and I find that just as an educator trying to be, you know, working as a community educator with people on this stuff, so. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, all of our panelists. <clears throat> Excuse me, thank you for to Jill and Allison, our principal. Um, and everybody who put this organization together, if you are from a different school and you'd like to have this at your school, come and talk to us. We can work together and maybe partner again and, and get this information out in the community. Um, have a great night. And I think if, I know it's after nine, but if you have to scoot, but if you have a question still, keep it going. Thank you, everybody.